was a joke some time ago about a very bright young professional who was downtown in a city in the south of the country shopping with his mother. Um, when they finished shopping, they were heading home and this rather unfortunate young man tripped and he slipped into the river. Um, his mother was naturally alarmed, but she was also very conscious of his place in the community. So she went around shouting at the top of her voice, help, help, my son, the surgeon is drowning, with the emphasis on the word surgeon. Um, fortunately, he was saved. Uh, there was a, an equally bright young person nearby who was able to swim and jumped into the river and rescued him. Now, this very bright young person had never gone to university, in fact, uh, had left school early because she had decided that she wasn't going to follow the academic route into university. She wanted to do an apprenticeship, which she did, um, and was so successful at it that she set up her own company um, and hired quite a number of staff. Whether she actually needed a surgeon or not, I don't know. So I don't know whether she actually interviewed him. But I think the story tells us a lot about our attitudes towards education. Now, education is one of those topics upon which are all experts. Everyone here, we all have one thing in common. We all went to school. Now, well, I assume everybody here went to school. You don't actually have to put your hand up if you didn't go. But having gone to school, that makes you all an authority on the system. I have yet to meet anybody, and I doubt if anybody here knows anybody who doesn't have views on education. We might know how to solve the never-ending health crisis, we might know how to fix the economy, but when it comes to education, everybody knows what's wrong with it, and everybody knows how to make it right. We, you could say that education is deeply ingrained in our psyche, it's in our mindset, it's in the way we think, and generally I think that's very good. But I think unfortunately sometimes we tend to look upon education as a hierarchy with the universities at the very top and we just have the subconscious belief that only the very brightest and the best and the most deserving get to university and get these uh, professional qualifications. I believe that we should look upon education and training as a continuum which people can dip in and out of all during their lives. Now, education systems throughout the world have one thing in common. Young people are staying in the education systems much longer than they used to. Um, participation rates are rising everywhere. And the majority of those young people take an examination, a terminal examination, at the end of their secondary schooling or their high school, uh, whatever they call it. Um, it could be the A-level in, in the UK, it could be the International Baccalaureate, the Abitur in Germany or in Hong Kong, the Diploma of Secondary Education. In Ireland, of course, we have the Leaving Certificate. It's an exam now taken by well over 90% of our young people. That's a very high finishing rate for second level schooling. Um, and it's become a high status exam and a high pressurising exam. Um, and young people will tell you that they feel under pressure in the run-up to the exam and during the exam itself. In Ireland, of course, we do things differently. We rely much more so than a lot of other countries on a terminal written examination. Other countries make use of practicals and orals and portfolios and projects, some element of continuous assessment and some element of teacher assessment of their own students for exam purposes. We don't. We rely almost entirely on a, um, a written final exam. As a result, it's a marathon writing session for those young people. Um, you would hear them complain sometimes that they have a sore writing arm afterwards, and it's, it's hardly surprising. But we do something else differently in Ireland as well. We give it an extraordinary amount of media coverage. In fact, no other country in the world gives the examination quite the same coverage that we do. We devote acres of space to an analysis of the questions, the reaction of teachers and students. And if the reaction is a very strong reaction, it, can get on the front page of the newspapers or on television or on radio. Um, in fact, the coverage we give is, has been studied by researchers from Oxford University Centre for Educational Assessment and Queen's University Belfast. And they concluded that the coverage given in the Irish media, and I'm including social media in this, is extraordinary by international comparisons. It was also looked at by the head of journalism in the National University of Ireland, Galway. 
um, I'm going to take out a note and quote her accurately because uh, she's an academic as well, so I better be accurate in this. She wrote the following, every June on the Wednesday following the bank holiday, exam fever of epidemic proportions appears to infect the media mindset. The temperature seems to rise year on year. And then the killer line, the acres of news coverage of the state examinations equate with those of some natural disaster or national emergency. I'd have to say, guilty, Your Honour, um, to some extent, because I was an education writer for quite a long time and probably contributed to some of that hype. The, the exam uh, gets huge coverage. The spotlight, the media spotlight, switches off abruptly when the exam finishes. But then it, it comes on again with the greater intensity when the results come out in August. Again, a whole forests of, of trees are felled to produce newspapers which produce huge supplements. We, they contain uh, graphs of the, the, the number of, of awards in, in each subject, um, who got what grade, how many grades were given in, in every single subject. And there are also very good tables which show, and not surprise anybody here, that girls always do better than boys when it comes to exam results, with one or two small exceptions. Um, but the, the, the coverage is really intense um, and then the, 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 the grades that those young people get are converted into what we call points for entry to higher education. Um, but what's interesting to notice, obviously if you get a, an A grade you get a higher points than, than if you get a D grade. But I think what's interesting to note is the way the question has changed in what we ask students when they get their results. When I did the Leaving Certificate a few years ago, um, I was simply asked, well, how did you get on? Um, so I was able to boast about results in English, and my favourite subject was actually Latin, not the most popular subject nowadays. Um, I was able to gloss over the other subjects where my performance was not described as stellar, to put it mildly, like maths and applied maths. But I wouldn't get away with that nowadays, because nowadays students are asked only one question. How many points did you get? It's as if there's a law that says you have to get points for, for entry to higher education. And the more points you get, the better. And if you get really high points, you have to go and do a professional course someplace, uh, in, in some university. Uh, now, university is uh, uh, really suitable for a lot of young people, but not for everybody, because there are other options, there are other routes to success. Um, there's a straight line, obviously, from A to B, but there's also what we call the, the scenic route, and quite a lot of young people take that. Um, they can go in different routes, uh, byways, if you will, they can go into cul-de-sacs even, they can come out of those, and they can go on a different path, if they're aware of the various and the increasing number of options that are available. But it's not always that easy for them to take that different and sometimes more interesting route. Um, I know one young person, she, a friend of my daughter's, she was under pressure from the school because she did very well in her leaving cert to go to university. But she decided she wanted to do a further education course in a rock school. Uh, she had visions of managing a rock band. Um, she didn't realise her ambition in that regard, but what she did do was develop her interest in the whole IT area and set up her own company, which is now very successful. Um, I met her at a 40th birthday party last week. It wasn't mine, in case you're wondering. Um, <laughs> And she was just back from our eighth trip this year alone to the States, uh, United States, for, on business purposes. Um, so she had gone down that scenic route, if you will. But as I said, it's not always easy to take that route because there is pressure from their peers, there's pressure from parents, um, except her parents were very enlightened and they let her do what she let, let her pursue her own course. Um, there's pressure from the schools in some respects. We had sometimes I think schools subconsciously uh, convey the message that uh, academe, traditional academe is better somehow. And as I say, it's not necessarily. Another example of this kind of, if you will, academic snobbery that, I, that is a, also a true story, it involves the agency that the government set up many years ago to encourage multinationals to come to Ireland and create jobs, the Industrial Development Authority. 
An official from the IDA was in a state-of-the-art IT plant in the west of Ireland. He was waiting to meet some of the executives of the American-owned company. Uh, I was chatting to the receptionist, a very bright young woman. Um, and he said to her, look, would you not think of, of doing a, a course in IT? You know, you'd clearly get a job inside. You'd, have a, you'd earn a lot more money and you'd have a much better career path. You could end up in a management position here in a few years. She said, though, revealingly, oh no, says she, my parents would never let me work in a factory. And unfortunately, that attitude, I think, still prevails to some extent in Ireland. I don't think we value vocational training, apprenticeships, skilled employment enough in this country. Uh, I'll give you an example of the World Skills Competition, which is held every two years. Now, not for nothing are they known as the Skills Olympics. They're run in a very competitive atmosphere. You have hundreds, if not thousands, of young people from all over the world competing in skilled areas like aircraft maintenance, electrical engineering, uh, craft design, welding and so forth. Um, Irish uh, uh, apprentices traditionally do very well in, in those skills Olympics, but I don't believe they're honoured sufficiently by the wider society and uh, I'd have to say by the media and by the political establishment when they come home. The next, the 44th international competition will be held at Abu Dhabi next year. I would hope that for two things. One, that the Irish participants do well once again, which I'm certain that they will, and they will come home laden with gold and silver and bronze medals. But I'd really like to see them greeted at the airport by the president of the country, who will congratulate them on what they have done for Ireland, because they really are ambassadors for this country, and I think they should be honoured as such. Um, talk about honouring, other countries also honour not just their, their winners but they also honour and value highly their traditions of vocational training, in company training, apprenticeships, um, in ways that we don't always yet. I'm thinking particularly of Germany which has a long established tradition in that regard. Um, there's a very close relationship between the employers and vocational colleges. They design programmes with the right balance of a uh, mix of theory and practice. And about half of young Germans go into this system every year. Um, it's been very successful in terms of keeping the economy at a, a, an expanding pace and holding that pace during the recent recession. Because during the, the recession, youth unemployment in Germany stayed static, but it rose very dramatically in other countries, including our own, but also Italy, Spain and Greece. Um, unfortunately, and many, many young people had to emigrate from, from those countries, including our own. But there, but there are very significant changes taking place uh, in education and training in this country. We have new apprenticeships, which are long overdue and very welcome. We have new traineeships, new internships. We have a strategic plan for the development of further education and training. We're making greater use of information technologies and other means of communication. And I think this is all to the good. But we also, much more importantly, we now have the structures in place to create a world-class uh, further education and training system. The changes I've described amount to uh, a revolution, if you will, but so far it's been a very quiet revolution. I honestly think we should be shouting about all these changes from the rooftops so that everybody will sit up and listen. Only then I think will everybody realise that there really are many different avenues to success. Thank you. Thank you.